Welcome to Navigate STL Schools, a podcast. My name is Anastasia Allen. I'm the executive director with Navigate STL Schools, and I'm here today with Jennifer Ilardi. 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 Thank you, <laughs> Jennifer Ilardi with Simple Positive Play. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And a lot of people just call me Miss Jen. Um, it kind of takes out the Ilardi part and <laughs> makes awesome. it a little easier. All right, Miss Jen. So I'm going to get you started with a question we ask everybody, and then we'll get into learning more about your organization and the work that you do with families in St. Louis City. Um, Tell us more about your personal K-12 education story. Where did you go to school? How did you get into this work? So I'm from a very small town called Louisiana, Missouri. It's a beautiful little river town that's in northern uh, northern Missouri, right along the Mississippi River. And so my growing up, um, there were a lot of people who already knew who I was because of my uncles Mm -hmm. and my cousins and my sister and so um, I had a really big sense of community in which I if I did something wrong on the way home or in school somehow my parents already knew about it by the time they got home from work and I all all I had said was hey good afternoon they're like hey why were you talking so much in class (laughs) Um, which was probably a safe bet that I was talking too much anyway but uh, um, I went all K through 12 um, in Louisiana and then after Louisiana high school I ended up coming down to the St. Louis area and going to Maryville University, where I graduated with my bachelor's in psychology and a minor in communications. Um, For my last semester at Maryville, I was able to go to Marist College and participate in a New York Media Experience program, where I worked for uh, Focus Features and for Rogue Pictures as an intern, and also worked at a pizzeria part-time in order to be able to make things work. So I got to live that Manhattan lifestyle uh, in New York for the right amount of time, because then I can come home. And then I did get my master's degree from Syracuse University many years later. um, And I got that in library and information science. And then beyond that, uh, there was a program through the University of Maryland for a postgraduate certificate in youth experience, where they were trying to really focus in on how children learn, play, and create, and what our role is in establishing that environment. And so I got my postgraduate certificate from from Maryland University or the University of Maryland uh, not too long ago. So I have, I love to learn. So awesome. Okay. Tell us about your organization before we hop into everything. What is Simple Positive Play? So Simple Positive Play started because I was feeling a little restless in figuring out what it is that I wanted to do with my life and like where I fit in. So I was working at the library. Uh, for the St. Louis County Library, wonderful organization that has grown by leaps and bounds over the past several years. And as it grew, there were certain things that needed to be um, more systematic across the whole um, organization. And I was still not uh, in a position to be able to make some of the choices and decisions that I was previously able to make. And so I was like, well, you know what? That's cool. This is my job. I can also have a hobby and I can do things outside of work that make me happy. And so I thought and I asked my parents if I could set up a space in their driveway and invite friends over, not friends, but like neighborhood kids to come mm-hmm. over with uh, me, my husband, my daughter, um, and cousins and that sort of thing. Just come over and let's play. And I set it up in my driveway. And I thought, well, if this works, then it works. If people support it, then I will keep doing it. If it doesn't work, then that would be just something that I did one time. But libraries are supported by your community, by people, and you have an input as to what goes on to it or goes into it, what resources are available, and how it is shaped. And so if I focused on just creating spaces for children and their families, how far could I go was pretty much the question that I asked. And then from doing things, hosting events in my parents' driveway, I was invited to use an artist studio where they let me use it for free. And it was wonderful to be inside. Mm -hmm. Um, And my mom was very pleased to not have people coming through her house so much. Um, And But that was really wonderful. And then I've been able to bounce from location to location until eventually um, in Ferguson, there was a couple of families who were wanting to add more value into the community by creating play spaces that were more accessible. Mm -hmm. Um, And through that, uh, the city of Ferguson now allows me to use an underutilized building at January Wabash Park where I filled it with all sorts of different toys and resources. So it's really been something that the community has lifted me up into and has supported me as I go. And I love being able to host kids and to watch their creativity. And um, it's something super enjoyable to me. And it's obviously something that families are looking for or else it wouldn't have lasted the eight years that it has at the Ferguson location. Okay, eight years. Mm -hmm. You've talked about the organization. Yeah. What is positive 
play? Isn't all play positive? Is there negative or neutral play? Like, what is positive play? Yeah, I'm so happy you asked this. So being able to come up with the name of simple positive play was not something that I took lightly. I really wanted it to be something that encompassed what I believed in. If I was going to just explore and really try to use my ideas, the name had to be important. So I think of things as being simple. Um, Anytime you're designing something, it has to start somewhere, whether it's a piece of like notebook paper or a napkin and you need to scratch scratch something out with a crayon in order to start there um, and then it will continue to grow. Also, sometimes when we feel overwhelmed, a single step is all you need to get going Mm -hmm. forward. So to keep it simple. Um, Sometimes we can build these elaborate creations if we have all of these different resources, but sometimes we don't have them. What can we do? How can we simplify it and make it out of cardboard or Mm -hmm. some duct tape or whatever we have lying around the house? Positive. I would. I love spreading positivity anywhere that I go. Sometimes it's very annoying to my friends and family, so I know how to keep my mouth shut sometimes. Uh-huh. <laughs> but yeah, so positive, adding that positivity into it and finding like, okay, well, today can be a better day. Something might have happened earlier, but you know what? I am nice and dry now. I was out in the rain trying to find a way into this building. And then once I read the signs and got inside, I'm drier and I'm not soaking wet. Um, And then playful. I think it's important for all of us to play. Uh, And whether it's a a child or an adult without kids or adult with kids, um, being able to take a little moment to find the things that you find joy in without it coming at some sort of cost um, or thinking of a consequence like a grade or Mm -hmm. um, a punishment if it's not perfect, you know, like Mm -hmm. just keep it simple, stay positive, keep a positive outlook on things and don't forget to play. So Simple Positive Play became the name of the organization. I love how you came up with the name and the concept of positive play. What kind of activities and things take place at Simple Positive Play? Great question. So with play, we know that children need, it's their way of being able to learn. It's their way of being able to engage. Also, when we are playing with our kiddos and we have those positive interactions with them, we're building relationships in a situation that's not so intense. Mm -hmm. So when we are able to play in times of um, low stress, when stressors do come up, you can open up those communication lines. You can understand what your kid likes a little bit more by just giving them a marker or asking what color they want to use Mm -hmm. um, or having different options of whether you want a marker, a crayon, a dot um, you know, thing, if you want to just use stickers. But you can watch your kiddo engage with all of the variety – We have all of those things in our space. (laughs) And you can watch as they gravitate towards different things and learn how your kid thinks, how you can communicate with your kid. Um, You can use your imagination with all of the different things that are available there. But we also encourage people to go home and to use the resources that they have available to them. We also try to give out kits and we have books available in our free little library to be able to take home. So a lot of it is about accessibility. And that's why we offer everything that we do for no cost. Um, We do try to get out there and get uh, donations at any time that we can, but it is such an important aspect to learning and to growing is to have these times where we can enjoy each other and have positive, playful experiences um, that really it builds communication and it just, again, helps us understand our child more and helps us navigate together a little bit better. So you've talked a lot about resources and kind of the story behind it. What is the age range of families that you work with? When we are at our space in Ferguson, it's not a huge space, which Mm -hmm. is also a lovely aspect to it in that we don't have to – it's big enough to be able to sit and watch your kiddo play without worrying about where they have gone to. Mm -hmm. Um, And although that is our main space that's there, we work with children and families of all ages. Um, That space is designed to cater to ages zero to nine. However, being able to work with teen volunteers is something that we're interested in doing more. We've worked with uh, professional organizations that have come in and helped us to pack kits for other kiddos that are at different festivals. When we go to Tower Mm -hmm. Grove Farmer's Market, when we donate things to different churches that are hosting um, parties and events, we've gone to different community events for Ferguson and Florissant. And in order to be able to prepare for that, we've enlisted the help of other adults in the community and teens again. Um, So it can stretch across the board but we do know that in those early years that play is so important and not just birth through five but beyond 
four through five, all the way up through, um, you know, like third grade, where as they're starting to learn, it becomes a little bit more intense um, about the things that they're learning and being able to play and to be okay with making mistakes and trying again and being playful with it and having that positive outlook is incredibly important to keep that, um, that learning stamina going. And that's what I want to help kids and families do. Okay. So how does play impact a child's early ability to learn? Play helps in so many different ways. Um, it helps us to understand how the world works. Mm -hmm. So even having like a little conversation, there was a kiddo the other day that was just kind of babbling. And of course I was like, uh-huh, oh wow, tell me more. Oh, really? And it seems silly, cause you know, it, for some it seems silly. To me it seems natural, um, but, but it shows them how to have a conversation. And that's a silly little play thing, right? Um, being able to build blocks and then knock them over. Um, oh, wow, like they, they fell over. Why did they fall over? Did we build them with the smallest one on the bottom and then tried to build things, you know, higher? Or like what you can do problem solving skills and, and um, you learn these things in a safe environment about peop around people who care about you. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's such a lovely thing to, to have to, um, to feel security in that. Uh, and to be able to play with loved ones. You also learn different skills as far as when it comes to using stickers on how to use your fine motor skills that help to be able to draw. When you are using your imagination, you can act out different scenarios that you might have person or emotionally, and you can work it out again in a safe environment and try on different hats and see how you feel in a certain persona. Uh, and it's just fun and to laugh and to grow uh, again around people who care about you is just important, I think. So I think that most people would be of the mindset that kids just know how to play. Like, why do they need a space like this? I will say I, I probably would disagree with that because I had my four nephews visit me this summer and they did not know how to play outside. They did wild? not know how to do a lot of things. And so uh, when, when they visit, we try to, I try to do like more kind of everyday activities in a playful manner. So like this this summer we did a cooking competition. Yeah. I let them learn how to season chicken before we put it on the grill. Yeah. Um, would that be something that's considered positive play? Are those like the kind of lessons that you guys incorporate into yes. the work that you do? Yes. I think um, what you mentioned and what you illustrated is how important your role was to be able to teach them how to do things. And so Something that's been very um, illuminating for me over the many years has been thinking about situations that I've had with my uncles. Like, oh, yeah, I learned how to do that with my uncle. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, my dad taught me how to do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, my mom told me how to do that. Or my sister, we played school together, and mm -hmm. then I t played school with my little sisters. But it has to start somewhere, mm -hmm. and if kids don't know how to play – um, they do have an imagination for sure. Mm -hmm. If you get them started, they can go in multiple different directions. And what we work on doing is helping to facilitate playful experiences. So that way we're not just sitting back and saying like, okay, go play. But we're modeling um, behavior when we do story times and we um, use just uh, – a more entertaining voice to be able to capture mm -hmm. their attention or incorporating games to be able to make things more fun. Not feeling bad if a kid walks away when they're not looking exactly at the book, but knowing that we are helping them when we just remain playful and engaged um, with the kiddos. And so we have a variety of different ways at Simple Positive Play to both um, use their bodies, especially with the young kiddos, trying to pull up on some of the different soft climbers. The big kids are great at using their imagination as they put on capes and scarves, and then parents pretend like there's a fire over in the corner, and then they, they put on their fireman hats and they come and they rescue them. And you see different people from the community coming together. So it's not just this parent and this child working together, but it's this community member helping this other kiddo get um, a toy down from the shelf helping mm -hmm. this other kiddo pass the mustard for their pretend sandwich that they're cooking over there. So um, and access to all of this stuff is extremely important because not everybody has 
the space for it. Not everybody has the funds to be able to purchase uh, the toys that are there. And also, kids go through toys pretty quickly. And so they like it one month, and then they don't like it, and you just spent 60 bucks on it for what? So we have lots of different things that are available as far as access goes, mm -hmm. and we offer it at no cost. So as you come in and you see what's there and available, you can also add input. You can volunteer. You can say, hey, I'm really struggling with this. Do you know anybody who can do this? And I've seen parents talk to each other about, oh, yeah, I use – XYZ resource in order to help me with this, uh, navigate this sort of situation with my kiddo. So um, there's just a lot of positive things that can come out of it. And it, it requires a little bit, um, I'm inviting you to play. What are, what would you say are some of the things that kids are learning in these positive play environments that could help them in a classroom or as they're going through uh, their, their learning or making friends phases in early childhood? Group work. Being able to use group work um, and to collaborate together. We don't, like I mentioned, we don't have the biggest space mm -hmm. available. So when you're in the space and if everybody wants to use the kinetic sand at one time, we got to share. If everybody wants to paint together, we need to have our space. How do we help somebody else get their paint or use one palette of paint of multiple colors to share between a couple of different people that maybe I haven't met you before? Mm -hmm. um, so we learned a lot of group work. Um, some problem solving skills. There was a kiddo that came in and saw that we had a kaleidoscope and wanted to make one of their own. And then they were stumped at how to make it. So we looked at the supplies that we had and they made their own kaleidoscope out of the materials that we had available. We have a coding program, uh, a little code and go mouse activity that I've seen four year olds go and press the button to make the mouse navigate a maze based off of the buttons that they pressed and made the mouse do. Mm -hmm. So they struggle. They need to find the right resources to be able to perform different experiments. And although they've created those experiments for themselves, that translates directly into the classroom. Um, being able to navigate what they're interested in on their own um, and seeing books that they like and start to look at uh, different words. And you see kids like, oh, yeah, I do know that truck. That truck is – or that word. That word is truck um, and blue truck. Like now I'm starting to read more because I like trucks and – you know, we're connecting that literacy and all these different things work together and it's all kind of child led. And then we're there to help like reach things for them and to connect something else. You like that truck book? I've got another book that you might enjoy. You like that paint? I've got this other kind of paint that you might enjoy. So this sounds similar to kind of like a Montessori based education. Would you would you say that it kind of aligns with some of those principles and like using the play aspect into teaching kids like real life skills? Yeah. So um, not only Montessori, but there are so many different people who have uh, added some uh, insight as to the way that child that children develop and that they learn and grow. Uh, and definitely something that's shared is the whole Montessori concept of it being child-led. And coming from a library background, that's kind of what I love about the library as well, mm -hmm. is that it's very much self-guided. And if I can reach the shelves, if I can access the books, if I can ask questions and feel safe to ask questions and check them out, um, that I feel like that empowers you to know that there's all this information that's out there mm -hmm. um, and you have access to learning positive things um, and making good choices if you you know if you have access to those different things it's easier to make those good choices so as you're as you're thinking about the work that you've done what do you think are some of the the misconceptions or like you know biggest challenges that you found uh, to pursuing this as a as a business I think one thing that is um, is hard is that there's a lot of playful things that I just I feel like I just do <laughs> and like I see the value in it and I'm just like oh yeah that connects with this and oh I've seen this student behave a certain way and by adding playful things or adding some manipulatives to the um, to the classroom or to the space at Simple Positive Play, I've seen them grow and learn and speak up and use their voice and ask for things and um, move their body and um, but I can't always it's it's hard to communicate that what I already innately feel, you know, like, oh, you have never made a sock puppet before. Well, I've made like multiple variations before I was 10. You know, like it's just an interesting way of saying of of looking at the world from a different point of view and realizing what value I can actually add to it and communicating. Um, I think that another issue is people do um, – I've come across that people do think that play is something simple and that all I do is I open a room and say, like, go for it, guys. 
no. I'm very much in there and trying to help parents connect to one thing or another. And I treat it like I'm a play hostess. You're welcome into our space. And I want to make sure that you have what you need in order to, to you know, move forward and to have a good day um, or, yeah, a good hour. And I think it's hard to explain all the work that I do behind the scenes of studying and prepping and organizing and um, getting help. Uh, and communicating that help, it, it, there's a lot that goes into providing a playful space, a lot of care, a lot of diligence, and you don't always see that. But that's the point. Like, I don't want you to see all that hard. Like, I want you to know that there's a lot of hard work in it, but I want you to be able to come in and feel comfortable. And so it's that that balance of trying to do what I'm passionate about and um, also share just how important it is and how much I care that people have access to a safe, playful space without um, – I don't know, without people poo-pooing it and thinking like, oh, yeah, sure, the room full of toys. It's like, no, for real, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> like, but, yeah, getting that out there has, has been kind of kind of tricky. But, but it's a wonderful place to be. So what are some of the common challenges or misconceptions that you might hear about positive play? What I think is a challenging aspect of it is sometimes people aren't sure what they're going to get into when they arrive. And that's not just the adults, but it's also the kiddos when they come in the door and they haven't been there before and they want to make sure that um, that they're following the rules. And I just want to make sure that they feel welcome for sure. Um, and then when it comes to being able to um, navigate our space and to realize that, oh, yeah, I do see that, and finding value in what it is that we provide. Uh, in some situations, we might have like a, a special story time or a more structured activity, but for our open play sessions, you can't show up late. If we're, as long as we're there, if we're open from 10 to noon and you show up at 11.45, you're not late. Mm-hmm. So we understand that things happen um, and that situations arise and we try to accommodate you as best as possible and even if you left your water bottle out we have extra water bottles in the refrigerator to be able to accommodate and so we really are there to try to help make things comfortable Um, your kid can't your kid really can't do anything wrong as long as they're not hurting themselves or somebody else and they're there's no wrong way to, to play as long as we're being safe. And I think sometimes we get so concerned about how, oh my gosh, my kid is this age and they don't know how to read yet. And that's sometimes, that's okay. They are where they are. We start where we are. So we might feel behind. As a parent, I know that I have felt like I was behind and not doing enough, knowing that I am doing everything that I can, it feels like. And then you'll see there are, is progress. You start where you are and you can keep moving forward. You're not behind. You're welcome when we're open. (laughs) And um, we want to help incorporate you into the discussion. Being a part of the discussion, you're the best person to be able to talk about your kiddo. And through that play, not only are you learning how they solve problems, how they approach problems, maybe they have a meltdown. um, And they just really don't like it. So how do we tackle it from that point of view? Um, you could sometimes it's hard to even think about your own experiences with math and you think I know I've had times where I've definitely apologized to my mom in my head multiple times on how stubborn I was when she was helping me with homework as I've worked with my own kiddo but um, through that you build relationships and with doing other playful things all the time playing board games, building with cardboard boxes, paper towel rolls, um, newspapers, uh, PVC pipe and making forts, um, whatever you do, that's a low challenge, like a low um, intense type of situation. Mm -hmm. And then when you have to do like studying, we're doing grades now, we're learning, we're being assessed um, by by what it is that we can learn and grow. Well, Well, speaking of grades, what are some of the like soft skills that kids can learn through play that can kind of translate to the classroom or like a learning environment? Yeah, absolutely. Like being able to share, Mm -hmm. being able to ask for things. I always tell, um, I encourage families to stay involved and to say, I really want this item to be in the space or I'm struggling with this sort of thing and to be able to communicate what your needs are. Um, I know that I also work in a classroom Mm -hmm. and knowing that my kiddos know how to navigate and problem solve is encouraging um, when it comes to offering more challenging experiences for them, which I also think they're going to get a big kick out of. They're going to love being able to build a Viking ship Mm -hmm. versus doing a worksheet and they feel comfortable with playing and toying with how to get the cardboard to work together because they've played before and they've played with different resources. So it reduces their their fear of failure. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. And teaches them group work and collaboration yes. and like connections through like, oh, this is my toy, but this is how it could act in real life yes. or things like that. So all of those things are kind of encouraged in your play space. Transitions, um, going from that same parent that might come in and be a little hesitant with the kiddo that clings to the leg um, in the beginning ends up sometimes being the the kiddo that's just like, no, I want to stay. Let me mm -hmm. stay here before we go. And so we work on transitions. Like, oh, once you get your shoes on, I can give you a sticker. I can give you a treat once you know you get this all together. And so we work on trying to navigate those types of situations. Um, the whole, I want to bring a toy home out of this space. I, I don't want to stop playing with this. Well, you know what? This is going to be here when you come back. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, you can ask about it. We can mm -hmm. totally figure out some, oh, you know what? I have something that's just like that. Here, how about that one? And we can really work on um, just working together as a community and playing together. Sometimes you have kiddos that are only children, um, and then they come across some babies <laughs> in the space, and they're like, whoa, 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 you just took my toy. And they have to figure out how to make that happen. Or big kids come in, and they have a little kid who's trying to paint. Well, you can't just push them out of the way, but how do we talk to others? get what we need and do it kindly. Yeah, so one of my nephews uh, has autism and we have been working a lot on that as a family uh, through play with helping him figure out how to take turns yeah. and share and to use uh, different items in different ways yeah. and understand that everything isn't just for one thing. Like we can play different things or in different ways. Yeah. And so as you're going through this space, you talked about like stage five clinger babies and only children, but like as you're going through that, like what uh, coaching or things do you give to parents if they want to kind of model some of those lessons at home or with other family that aren't in the center? I know you bought your book with you today, but like, how do we build those things in for parents and family members to help kids better understand their world through play? Yeah. One of my favorite things to do is to watch how other parents engage with each other. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I don't have to say a word, uh, but it's a lot of encouraging. I, I don't want to ever like parents are the experts for their kiddos and they are the authority figure. Mm -hmm. So I never want to, um, to be disrespectful in any way. So if your kiddo is like dumping the blocks out and you tell them, no, I'm not going to say, Oh honey, go ahead and just dump them all out. I might look at the parent and say like, I'm okay with it. So if you're okay with it, then I'm okay with it. We'll come back up and we'll pick, I'll help you pick them up in, in a little bit. But So I think part of it's support. And then as parents get more comfortable, they do end up talking to each other about, well, what school are you going to? I'm going here. Or what, um, you know, the books and, and that kind of, uh, those types of resources. Or they'll look at some of the blocks and say, oh, yes, that he keeps playing with those. That's going to go on the birthday list, you know, or, or the, the Christmas list. But um and I think that just staying engaged, you're not there to just sit to the side. Mm -hmm. But like you mentioned, it's you and your family helping out your nephew. And in our space, we do end up having some consultants that come through, some behavior analysts that come through um, and support people that will use the space to, to um, monitor and to evaluate what the kiddo's doing at any given time. And I also think that coming into this space and playing, even just as a parent and a child, uh, without any other professional play therapist or anything to come along with, you can observe your kiddo and say, like, what I noticed is that my kiddo um, will only do will only stack the blocks three high or mm -hmm. they always put things blew things down on their paper and then peel it back up again is that appropriate or my kid seems to always have a reaction in this certain type of scenario but you become the observer and you can take that information to your doctor to any other support system and like i said that it's not just me who does it I have other volunteers who are very qualified to be able to help share information um, they work for at various organizations and they're in connection with other people in the community and so I hear families helping and sharing with each other what they're going through um, and so there's a bit of that camaraderie mm -hmm. going on and then yeah it's a, a it's more than just me being like and this is where you go like you get to learn about everybody's experience and kind of explore in a more collective way awesome and as we're thinking about uh when this episode is going to air we're going to be airing this in uh, November, uh, October, November. Um, what are some of the things that you think parents should consider, especially for younger kiddos, um, in their play to help get them ready for school? Books. 
Yay! <laughs> so, <laughs> books and getting something in their in their hand to be able to start writing. Um, when it comes to hearing stories, picture books are one of the greatest things I think ever. I love being able to read picture books. I'll stop my dad and read him a picture book if I think it's funny. Um, but not only are they entertaining, but they also include a lot of language that we don't always use every day. Like uh, sometimes we might say I'm mad, but have you ever said furious? You know, like, and you see that in some stories. Like, oh, he was furious. What a great word. Um, and so using books to be able to expand that vocabulary and encourage that vocabulary and conversation. Also, when it comes to getting something in their hand to be able to draw with, whether it's a marker or a crayon, scribbles create writers. So you start with a scribble. You might not know what it is, but then when you ask them, oh, can you tell me a little bit about your story or about your picture is a great phrase I like to use versus I like your horse when it's really a picture of you is not the best way to navigate. <laughs> so if you ask, you know, tell me a little bit about your picture, then they're using their narrative skills. You're giving them a chance to use their voice mm -hmm. to come up with the words that they want to say and taking the time to give them to respond. So I think books and writing, um, and songs, and um, all of those things, just engaging with them, talking to them as you're walking through uh, the aisles of the store about the different colors that you see. Just any time you can incorporate positive language and not directive language, like uh, go sit down, go mm -hmm. to sleep, eat this. But the more positive language you include, um, the help, the better. Awesome. And then what are some of the collaborations you guys have coming up uh, for this next year? So we've been working with a variety of different people, whether it's been Earth Dance Organic Farm School, we've worked with parents as teachers, and we also work with the Hood Connect, which is a nonprofit organization located in our community. And we are just looking forward to um, being able to to share our resources and to be able to add what we can and contribute to the overall message of helping families educate their children in St. Louis. So if it's a group effort. Awesome. And then are there any other things that you want to share about Simple Positive Play? Where can people find you? How do they play with you guys? Yeah. How do they support your mission? Best way to find out about us is to look at our website, which is simplepositiveplay.org. I also wrote a whole book called Simple Positive Play at the Library. And of course I talked about it being at the library because that's where I really did learn about the having access to certain resources makes a big difference. Also learning how to use the resources you have access to makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Having it right in your community, every community has a library there. And it is a public library for a reason. You can add your input um, and you can add what it is that you need. You can communicate that there. And I've been able to meet so many awesome librarians who really take what the community says and transform it into something that is extremely helpful and beneficial for the community. And my focus just happens to be on play and incorporating students together. My book also includes a lot about design thinking and about how we can take a simple idea and make it grow, just like I started Simple Positive Play in my parents' driveway and have been able to make it grow into an organization that collaborates with different organizations organizations in St. Louis, like Metro Theater Company. It's amazing to be able to work with so many different organizations and start with something simple to stay positive about it and remember that it's something that I really love to do. And that's what my book's all about. Where do we find you? So you can find us with uh, at our website at uh, www.simplepositiveplay.org. We are also on Instagram at Simple Positive Play and on Facebook is where we keep uh, the most updated schedule on when we'll be open as we get volunteers to do pop-up plays every now and again. Awesome. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you learned a lot about the power of play and check out Miss Jen and Simple Positive Play on Facebook, Instagram, and at her website, which will be linked in this episode. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for listening. All right. Thank you. Thank you.